Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Vietnam Innovators. I'm your host, Hao. Thank you for tuning in and supporting the show. Uh, today's guest is a visitor from Hanoi. He originally hails from the UK and has been all over Asia, working in the likes of Tokyo, Shanghai, Singapore, and Bangkok, and is now in Hanoi as the Chief Retail Banking Group Officer for Techcom Bank. Uh, thank you so much for making your time available, Darren. Yeah, Darren. Good morning. Nice yes. to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, Darren, you have a wealth of experience, uh, no pun intended. Yeah. Um, when I look at the notes about what we're going to speak about today, I have a lot of questions about the insights and case studies about what you and your team can bring to Vietnam. Because here, it's relatively new, but it's fast emerging. And a lot of young people and older people are willing to adopt new technologies. So Techcom Bank being one of the largest banks in Vietnam, a lot of room to play, a lot of room to introduce new technologies, new behaviors, new practices. Um, let's deep dive into that. So just how about a quick elevator pitch intro uh, about you, Darren, and then we can get started. Yeah, sure. Uh, as I said, it's great to be here. Um, I've been in banking for, uh, I should whisper this quietly, mm -hmm. 35 years. Okay. Uh, I spent most of that time in larger developed markets, so London, New York, Tokyo. But I've also spent significant time in, uh, in Shanghai, in Singapore, uh, six years also in, uh, in Bangkok, in Thailand, and also spent time across Africa and the Middle East. Wow. So. Okay. That's a lot of time. You look very young, though. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. We're going to start with some rapid fire questions, too, so the audience can get to know you a little bit better, and then we'll get into the podcast today. There's no right or wrong answer, so and keep your uh, answers a bit shorter. This is for the one minute videos that um, the internet loves these days. So let's get started. So first question for you, Darren, uh, what brought you to Vietnam? Well, first of all, I, you know, I've spent 10 years in Southeast Asia already. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I used to work for a bank where I ran their business in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. I also spent uh, significant time in Singapore. So I had a, a kind of an interesting background across Southeast Asia. I love this part of the world. And when I was heading a bank in Thailand and also in China, what I saw was many of my institutional clients mm. redirecting investment out of those markets into Vietnam. Okay. Uh, and so in dialogue with these corporate clients, you kind of got to understand why they were thinking about Vietnam, why sending more investment into Vietnam as opposed to their more traditional markets for different reasons, Thailand and, and China. Mm. Uh, and so for, that was interesting. Um, the opportunity to come back to Vietnam, which uh, at this stage, this part of the world, Southeast Asia, um, as I said, is, is really of interest. Uh, so it's, it's a great opportunity and it's exactly the right time to be here. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your intro about digitalization and so on. I mean, if you think back sort of 2010, 2012, now 10 years on uh, and post COVID, Vietnam is digitizing incredibly fast and that opens up new opportunities to be able to serve retail customers at scale in this market. Mm. Uh, and we're kind of there at that point where this change is happening. Yeah. So that's what makes it exciting to be here in Vietnam. It's so, great. So the right first. question is, it's great. why not Vietnam? Right? Why not indeed? Why not? Why not? It's, why not? it's time. <laughs> I understand that's a motto at Tech on Big that you've introduced as well. So we'll talk about that in a little bit later. Uh, next question. Uh, what excites you about Vietnam? Well, again, I, you know, I think look, the, it's a market right now that is getting a lot of attention. It, it is a market that is growing at, at one of the fastest paces of, of markets around the world. Mm -hmm. The uh, inward investment is significant, um, but also how Vietnam is starting to be recognized around the world. Let's not forget this week mm -hmm. we saw VinFast. Uh, with its IPO in, in the US uh, generate a huge amount of interest, becoming the third most valuable mm. um, uh, auto manufacturer. Right. Um, the opportunities right now and, and what is happening in Vietnam is exciting. At mm. the same time, if you think about the demographics, um, it, it, it is a sweet spot. Mm. Uh, many countries have got more aging populations, but Vietnam, uh, has really got a, a population that is really at, at the right spot for growth. Okay. Um, if you had to explain to a stranger what you do at Techcom Bank, how would you do it? Um, I try to work with a great team of people to meet customer needs so that they can go spend their time on non-financial matters. They can go and spend time on things that are important to them. We'll take care of the banking uh, aspect. So. Everyday payments, no problem. If you've got the one-off episodics, you want to buy a house, you mm -hmm. want to invest in fixed income, or you want to think about protection for your family, we can handle that for you. But 
hopefully we can do it in a way that it's, it's quick, it's seamless, it's intuitive, and, and you don't have to worry. What's a myth about banking that you'd like to debunk today? You know, I was speaking to someone earlier this week, and they said that there's a little bit of history in, in Vietnam that people kind of say, hold on, I put my money with the bank, and then every time I want to get money out of the bank, uh, the bank charges me a little bit here and a little bit there, and, and that's not really fair. Mm. Um, Techcom Bank, a few years ago, we were the first out there with uh, fee-free uh, for everyday banking. Mm. And we've just doubled down on that to make sure it truly is fee-free banking. Uh, for anyone who's got a current account with us. Okay. Most simply, you know, a bank at the end of the day is a place where it should be incredibly safe for you to store your money. Put your money here, access it whenever you want, and we'll take care of it in, in, a, in a very safe way. Um, so I think uh, Techcom Bank, certainly, we are, we're not here to, uh, to try and take a little bit of money here and there. We want to create value for our clients, uh, and hopefully the value that we create um, is, is meaningful for the clients we serve. So the question there is, why aren't they taking my money? They're not. So you guys are not uh, definitely very good. Um, okay, next question for you, Darren. Um, what makes Techcom Bank different from other banks? Everybody says they're client-centric, right? You can't run any type of business unless you're client-centric. But yeah, this is our 30th anniversary. Mm. And, and this year, in 30 years, I, I think as I look at Techcom Bank, and I really see right at the, the core of, of our core values, client centricity is more than just, hey, it's a nice thing to talk about, and then let's go sell products. It's the, re it's the way we want to run our business. Um, so we have, a, we have an extensive uh, business segments team that is constantly doing customer research, really trying to deep dive into what do customers need. And, and it's not big groups of customers. What, mm. what do 12 million retail customers need? No, no, no. We break it down into segments and into individual personas. And then we deep dive into what each of these different personas really needs and what are their current pain points and, and what are their journeys, their everyday journeys, so they can access what they need, when they want it, how they want it, wherever they want it. And that's what we want to provide. We want to deliver the very best solutions and offerings that we can in this marketplace, but in, in a way that it really is tailored uh, specifically to different types of individuals. And we're investing a significant amount of money into technology to enable that. You know, you, you go back 50 years, banking was where well, you'd walk into a branch, you'd get to know the branch manager, they would know you, and there was a personal relationship that would develop over time. That was, that was banking. You can't do that at scale. And that's where data, digital technology enables that hyper-personalization mm -hmm. at scale. And so, you know, we've invested, we're working with AWS uh, in Singapore and putting a lot of our infrastructure and technology into the cloud. We've just deployed uh, the Salesforce CRM uh, for our frontline staff, which is leading technology around the world. We're the only bank in Vietnam to deploy Adobe Analytics as our marketing tech stack. We've built a, a data warehouse that enables us now to get some really smart people to do lots of modeling and create these models that enable us to identify what each of our customers are wanting. And through the other technology that we've uh, deployed and are deploying, mm. we're now able to nudge customers, hopefully with something that is meaningful, relevant, when they want it, how they want it in their channel of choice. That's the difference of Techcom Bank. Uh, talking about innovation, what's one innovation at Techcom Bank that you're particularly proud of? Well, innovation is, is kind of a broad subject. I mean, I'm, I'm actually proud of many of the different things. I, I'm actually proud of the way the team rolled out a new Techcom Bank mobile banking application mm -hmm. uh, last year. It, it's a very fresh. It looks very different. The, uh, the interfaces are incredibly intuitive. Mm -hmm. You know, people talk about their, their mobile phones. You take an Apple iPhone and... and you kind of like that white box and you open it up and it's got a little smell that you're familiar with. You take it out, you turn it on, no one looks for the manual. You turn it on, it works, and you kind of know how to use it. Mm. Well, that's our mobile banking app. You turn it on and you don't have to ask, oh, how do I do this, how do I do that? You, you just explore a little and you can find everything that you possibly need, information you need, services you need, access to solutions that you need. And it's been done in a way that the UI UX is, is really very seamless and intuitive for, okay. for our customers. 
but there are so many examples of, of innovation that are happening uh, every single day at Techcom Bank, big and small. Um, as I said, we're 30th anniversary this year, but we're, we're like a, a startup fintech. Mm. Never short of new ideas, and, and really those ideas are, are founded on the basis of understanding our customers. Very good. Last question before we get into to the podcast today. Um, on a Sunday at 10 a.m., where would you be and what would you be doing? Usually I've just finished uh, a good workout and usually go for a run, um, grab a coffee, and then be trying to cool down with a cold shower. Okay, very good. Let's dive into today's podcast, Aaron. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, you have a wealth of uh, kind of insights and case studies from all around Asia. And here in Vietnam, people still use a lot of cash. When we think of competition from a traditional industry point of view, you think of potentially other banks, other mobile apps, and that's true, you need to innovate on those and be the market leader. But actually, the number one competition is kind of the cash, right? Because that is the, the barrier to technology adoption, to cards and QR codes and whatever else is out there in terms of forms of payment. So I want to keep that in mind and for our audience to keep in mind, because if you, if you have questions and, and things that you want to know about this, you keep listening to the podcast, but also drop your questions in the comment. Um, Darren, we talked about your mindset. Why not? I want to dive into that a little bit more. Why do you have this mindset here in, in Vietnam in particular? And um, how has it influenced the choices you've made in your career and to where you are now? You know, I think I've had a, a somewhat unusual career. Uh, if you think about the, um, the countries that I've worked in, um, across banks, I think I, I've done pretty much most things. I, okay. I've worked in institutional banking, retail mm. banking, uh, I've run large markets business, I've done operations, I've done collections, mm. I've been in finance, all sorts of different things. What I've done through the years is, is, is always look to see where can I make a difference and where I think I, uh, there is a role that one, I would enjoy, Two, I think I could do it well. Three, I think I can make a positive difference. Those are the roles that I've taken. I haven't necessarily said, no, you know, my career path has to go this way. My career path has to go like this. Mm -hmm. um, it's where do, where do I find things interesting? And so as a result, it's taken me, it's taken me from everywhere. It's taken me from Kenya in Africa through to Tokyo. It's taken me from um, Islamabad in, uh, in Pakistan to Bangkok and to uh, Myanmar and all sorts of other places. That journey itself has been kind of interesting for me. Uh, and, and that's where this why not sort of mentality comes. You know, why not? Let's, let's try that. Mm. And when you think you get to a point where you're saying, you know what, it's okay. This is now running pretty well. It's time for somebody else to, yeah. to take it on and see what they can do. That's when you say, okay, enough is enough. Time to move on to, to something else. And just, just... Mm. Look at it this way. If you think um, you spend about one third of your life um, sleeping, imagine that, 30% mm. of your life asleep. You spend another 30% of your life where you're, you're kind of too young or too old to be fully able to enjoy life. So that middle 30 to 40% of your life is when you're, you can be really active and engaged. And you spend that majority of that is, is really working. Mm -hmm. So you need to enjoy what you do mm -hmm. and you need to feel that you, you're doing something positive and, and making a difference. So why not? Yeah. Having a purpose and knowing what your impact can be. That's, that's really important. I'm going to switch gears a little bit to your, to your role, uh, chief head of retail banking chief in Vietnam. Chief retail banking group officer. There you go. It's a mouthful. Yes. <laughs> um, it's, it's one of the biggest, I'm sure, in terms of the offerings at Techcom Bank as well, reaches millions of customers. I'd like for you to kind of touch base about how you think about innovation for the offerings in relation to the evolving financial landscape. Um, for instance, one of your colleagues, uh, I believe she's the head of content at Combank, she posted this morning about how she moved from Ho Chi Minh City to Hanoi, and she was pleasantly surprised by how the proliferation of QR codes was everywhere in Hanoi compared to Ho Chi Minh City, where cards or which much higher adoption. So she was telling me as well, like the, the digital app of Tech on Bank, she thinks it's gonna be a monster in Hanoi because people love using the QR code there. So anyways, I just wanted to give that a little context. Um, we'd love for you to share more about how you approach innovation given how rapidly changing mm. the landscape is. is so so let's, let's talk about that. You, you said at the beginning, right, mm. you know, cash, uh, we're, we're really competing against cash. And, yep. and that's exactly what our deputy chairman mm. says all the time. Mm. Our main competitor is not another bank. Yeah. 
our main competitor is cash. How do we take cash out of the system? Yeah. And how do we compete to be better than cash? Now, mm. first of all, I challenge anybody to just go onto Google and look up how many uh, viruses and bacteria you get on the average uh, cash bill. Mm. Right? That in itself should scare people. It's pretty yeah. nasty what you can catch from cash bill. Okay. Put, put that to one side. Sure. Right? Yeah, cash, cash is traditionally, it's been, it's been used for many years in coin form or paper form, and mm. people are comfortable with that. And it's very fungible. It's easy to kind of move around, and there's, it's, it's, it's physical. So, so a lot of stuff in finance is invisible. Mm. And, and therein lies a challenge for many people. How, how do you understand something where you can't see it? Mm. Um, if you make stuff, you see what you make. And yep. then when you go to buy stuff, you go look at it and say, yeah, I can feel it, I can touch it, I like it, I don't like it. But finance is, is intangible mm. and it's intangible assets. You know, cash is, is kind of something people are very familiar with. Um, when, I, when I moved to Shanghai, uh, first thing I did, I went to an ATM and I withdrew cash. Mm -hmm. Four years later, I left Shanghai and moved to Vietnam. The cash I took out of the ATM machine, I still had in my pocket. Wow. Never used it. Mm. As soon as I got into the office, I was signed up for WeChat Pay and Alipay, uh, and I was using QR codes the entire time. Mm -hmm. uh, the street vendors on the street, they all had QR codes, as well as the biggest shops and merchants all having QR codes. Well, let's touch upon that too. System. How about cards? I mean, that's like the main form of payment for the average, let's say, white collar uh, worker nowadays. Like right? they cash into something more a bit flexible, I guess you could say. And there's credit cards, debit cards. How was your experience in China using cards? Was that adopted at all? Well, only Union Pay. Okay. Uh, okay. Visa right. and Mastercard. Those networks right, are not right, right. are not uh, not accepted Present, yeah, yeah. in in China. So mm -hmm. Union Pay. Mm -hmm. um, it really, it was easy to use a union pay card in bigger retail merchants, small shops now, right? Okay. Um, but what, what people generally did for just everyday easy spending, it's QR payments. It's very simple, open up the app, scan, done. So Techcom Bank's future, it sees its, its future in the whole system to pioneer the adoption of the mobile app, let's say, QR code. Well, when it, when it comes to payments, we, we've taken a view that we will enable mm. all of our customers to make payments in any form factor that they want to make payment in. It doesn't matter. Yep. We will just provide access to whatever you want. We're, we're not going to say, hey, come to Techcom Bank, uh, mm. you have to use a debit card, or it has to be a Visa debit card, uh, and or you have to use our QR code. No. If you want to have a wallet, we'll make, well, we're connected to the wallet. You can move money into your wallet, out of your wallet, and you can make payments through your wallet. That's okay, too. It, okay. It, really, it's your choice. Mm. We are trying to create as many new ways to enable customers to make uh, payments in, in a way that is totally flexible and convenient for them. So yeah, we're, we're also looking at other things. Should we be using palm payments, mm. uh, facial recognition, retinal scans, or fingerprint access? Some of that is easy for customers to do. You know, as again, quote our deputy chairman, he talks yeah. about how do we become cashless, cardless, and appless? Mm. Um, we can. The, the, the technology is available, but at the same time, we've got to see what would be adopted by our customers. Are you comfortable giving your fingerprints to the bank mm. and us storing those fingerprint records and then enabling you to make a payment with a fingerprint? Yeah. You might be, you might not. That we need to understand what do our clients feel comfortable with before we would invest in that type of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the premise is very, very simple. Everything that is being developed, wherever it may be developed around the world, we will try to find and bring the best of that to Vietnam and enable it for our clients if our clients are saying, hey, that would be really helpful, that would be really useful. Very we good. do that. We, uh, we really are looking for talent around the world. So if we just think about the last 18 months, we've held talent recruitment roadshows in Singapore, in London, in San Francisco, in Sydney, Australia. We've gone to these markets, we specifically held open row shows to try and uh, ensure that people really understand what's happening in Vietnam, what's happening in Techcom Bank, and bring the best talent that we can to this market to enable us to be uh, leading when it comes to innovation around the needs of our clients. How, how innovative is the Vietnam market for the financial system payments in particular payments compared to all the other places well, you've been? Uh, let, me, let me give you an example of an innovation of payments in the United States. Mm -hmm. One is to enable a simple transfer from one customer to another mm. in a mobile app. 
doesn't right. sound that innovative. Mm -hmm. A bigger innovation is that when you receive a check, do people in Vietnam even know what checks are? Because mm. people in Asia haven't used checks for what, I yeah. don't know, 10, 20 years. But anyway, people in the US still make check payments. When you get your check, you can scan the check through your mobile app so the funds get deposited into your current account. Mm. That's innovation in the US. That doesn't really feel like innovation. That's like taking really old legacy processes mm -hmm. and just digitizing them. Mm. That's not digitalization. Yeah. Okay. What's happening in Vietnam is very different. Mm. And that's exciting. Vietnam really now over the last few years has started to shift from following others to leading others. Uh, and so the, uh, the uh, innovation that is happening in the payment space and in other aspects of financial services sector is actually pretty advanced. In terms of what the financial system is able to deliver, that's not as advanced as some other markets. Mm -hmm. But where we are able to deliver financial service solutions here, we're trying to find ways to do it in, in, in the most advanced ways possible. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you guys cover all types of customer needs. And I'm sure you have a, a variety of different customers themselves as well. Um, I, we have a term here, uh, we often hear the phrase in Vietnam especially, money never sleeps. Mm. Um, I'd love for you to, to address how Tech on Bank and your team in particular on the retail banking side addresses all these customer needs across so many different spectrums. How, where do you start and, and where do you end and where does it end? Well, you know, I, I kind of look at it, I split it into two areas. Mm. One, payments. Mm -hmm. uh, why, do, why do people put their money into a bank? They put it into a bank because it's safer than putting it under the mattress. Yep. Uh, and they want to be able to access it whenever they can. So if we can enable a safe way for customers to store their money and then get access, it, mm -hmm. access to it yep. as easily as possible whenever they want, however mm -hmm. they want, that's one aspect of our retail banking. Yep. And that, that covers the needs of, potentially that can cover the needs of everybody in the market. However, this is a market where wealth is growing and accumulating. Um, what GDP per capita grew last year around 10%. Mm. It's still relatively low, about $4,100, but it's growing faster. Um, by 2030, I think they estimate to be something like 7,500. Mm -hmm. With that growth in wealth, mm -hmm. people start to have funds mm -hmm. that exceed their daily payment needs. Mm -hmm. And so how do you help people um, put that money into something that is able to generate additional returns. Mm -hmm. And so that starts to be the wealth side of the business. Let's talk about that. Uh, retail banking, and, and you've just mentioned a very key term wealth, which we talked about in terms of, in relation to your experience. But talking about the context of banking and how Vietnamese perceive wealth, how is that perceived in Vietnam, like wealth management, wealth creation, but also what is considered being wealthy? Like when you guys at Techcom Bank communicate wealth management, what does that mean for customers in Vietnam? Is it, are they in the affluent sector group or like aspiring affluent? Maybe you can paint that picture. Well, I, think, I think everybody is slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at a basic level, if, if you have funds in excess of what your everyday spending needs are, you've started to accumulate a level of wealth. Mm -hmm. Now that wealth goes from a very, very low level to an extremely high level to up to today, the wealthiest man in, in Vietnam is number 32 on Forbes list. Right. I didn't check where the share price was on Friday, so <laughs> yeah, give or take, somewhere sure. on that list, right? Um, big extremes. If we look from 2017 to 22, uh, people with wealth at a level of $1 million or more has been growing at about 70%. Is that the highest in the world or one of the highest? It's one of the highest. Okay. Yeah, by contrast, take, uh, uh, take Thailand. I think that was growing at about 24% mm. through the same period. In terms of numbers, what does that mean though? You know, population of 100 million, well, how, how many people? It's about 70,000 people okay. in Vietnam as of 2022. Uh, Thailand was about 95,000 mm. people. And as we look out through the next few years, um, it's, Vietnam's expected to grow at that level of wealth, uh, something, um, something close to uh, around 60%, about 112,000 people. Okay. And again, Thailand growing slightly less, mm -hmm. um, but absolute numbers still slightly more. Once you go beyond 1 million, take another threshold, 30 million. Yeah. Yeah, here in, in Vietnam, we're talking about, while the growth has been great, 81% over the same period, but it's only 1,100 people, very small. Slightly higher than Thailand, actually, 940. 
uh, estimated in China. Yeah, a bit of a side but, question too, that wealth creation, is it being mostly from the older generations or the newer generations that are starting work today? Like where is that wealth creation coming from? The wealth Actually, creation as it is, is largely from people now who are in their 40s, mm. 50s. Um, you know, you think about Vietnam status, and it really started from what, 1986 or so, where there mm -hmm. were some changes, fundamental sure. changes. Yep. Uh, and from that, that's enabled people over the last, what, 30, 40 years, whatever that is, mm -hmm. to um, be able through their own creativity, their, their ideas, their, their business skills, acumen, whatever, to create opportunities to, to grow wealth. With that wealth creation, you could say that the products around wealth management have been fairly underdeveloped in the past because the market just hasn't been that large. Now it's you're, you're mentioning 60% growth in a, in a few years. That's massive. There's a it, lot of... It is, yeah. but still relatively small numbers. Okay. So, uh, you know, the challenge is, uh, there's a number of different challenges. Uh, you know, one, Vietnam is a managed economy. Mm -hmm. As part of that managed economy, like, like others at this stage of its development, they are also very careful in terms of how the exchange rate is managed. Mm -hmm. um, that has, Im has implications in terms of the cost of uh, exports. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously if the currency becomes too strong, exporting to the world increases the price of exports from Vietnam and, and could be non-competitive. Mm. Uh, flip side of it is, you know, Vietnam yeah. also has to import. So right. if the exchange rate is in slightly different space, mm -hmm. then the imports become too expensive and that also is a problem for the economy. So there are constraints and money doesn't flow freely outside of Vietnam. So mm. what can you invest in? So the asset classes here, you know, people put money into their business. And that's a key part of where money goes. People put money into real estate uh, and into land. Uh, and people have traditionally put money into gold. Those have been three areas of wealth um, that people with wealth have been able to put money in to grow wealth further. Are, are there new like, wealth management products coming out soon that you see in the next few years? That well, potentially well there are soon? already. There, sure. there start to be more investment uh, products. Mm. So, you know, we you know, obviously equities um, through TCBS, our securities entity, okay. uh, customers can invest directly into equities. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, TCBS has what? It's like somewhere between 7 to 10% market share already. Okay. Uh, and about 540 trillion of, of equity AUMs. It's, it's pretty sizable. Mm. So that is, a, that is a, an asset class mm -hmm. um, that clearly has been growing. Okay. Fixed income too, you know, Techcom Bank and TCBS through our value chain with our institutional clients. Mm -hmm. you know, we've created a dominant market share in bonds and, and fixed income. And that's, that's an alternative to traditional bank manufactured products like mm -hmm. time deposits where you get a fixed interest rate. Well, with a bond, you get a fixed interest rate over a certain tenor. But what you are taking, you're taking a little bit of liquidity risk and you're taking credit issuer risk. And so as a result, you're getting a slightly higher potential return as long as you're comfortable with those risks. And therein lies the problem of wealth management in Vietnam. It's the level of financial education and financial understanding around new opportunities to invest. That's a, that's a great point. That somewhat inhibits our ability mm. to create some of the solutions that exist in other markets. We have to keep pace with financial capability because customers have to understand the different risks. Mm. You can't assume that a bond is just like a time deposit. It just pays a high level of interest. It only pays a high level of interest because it has a different risk profile mm. and you have to understand that. So we need the skills in our own team to be able to explain that to mm -hmm. clients so that they, they, they fully understand. And clients also need to be receptive to understanding that you know, typically a, any customer, you ask them, hey, what sort of product would you like? Well, I want one that pays the highest possible or, or generates the highest possible return, has no liquidity risk mm -hmm. and has no loss of principal risk. Okay, but even if you take out a time deposit, you're taking some level of risk because mm -hmm. you're taking risk on the underlying financial institution that issues the time deposit. How do, how do we help customers actually understand risk and return? Uh, and other than technically they say US government bonds are the only risk-free financial instrument around the world, questionable with the recent rating of the US government. Um, but uh, yeah, outside of that, everything has a relative risk. Uh, and so wealth management and the advances in wealth management have to keep pace with the financial education uh, and financial capability of retail customers in the market. Yeah, given your, your team's current understanding of that level of education, what are you guys doing uh, in relation to that? And, and 
why are you doing that or why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I would say that Techcom Bank is already the leading wealth manager mm. in, in, this, in this market. Mm. Between Techcom Bank and our securities entity, yep. we've got 1,100 trillion. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you say after a trillion. Yeah, so 1,100 trillion. Fathom. <laughs> there's a lot of zeros yeah. uh, in assets under management for our clients. I mean, that, I mean that is significant. Mm. But the, uh, the 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 asset classes that we really provide for our customers is real estate investing through our developer clients, where we have a close relationship with the top developers in this in this market. Mm -hmm. It is our own bank manufactured products, simple savings products, regular savings, time deposits, CDs, etc. Uh, and then we also provide access to bonds, which are distributed on behalf of our wholesale bank clients through the securities entity to mm -hmm. our retail clients. And then equities provided through TCBS. These are the four big asset classes. And then wrapped around all of that, we provide protection solutions. Mm -hmm. So those who have longer term protection needs, thinking about life assurance, etc., uh, that we provide through our partner Manulife uh, as a full spectrum set of wealth management solutions here. Now, that said, there are some clients that have needs beyond that, um, at those, those and, asset classes. And let's talk about that, too. Um, what's going to drive a lot of the wealth management success and sustainability of it are these new business owners, these entrepreneurs yeah. who are uh, building their wealth and diversifying it in other types of products. So you mentioned like land and gold has historically been the center of it, term deposits. Um, and those will still be great, but of course, they have risk profiles and we see the economic situation today, uh, a lot of uncertainty about the real estate market. I think it's still a great investment, but a lot of people don't. And, and I mean, what do I know? Um, it, it's about the education of these future products. So my question for you is, could you provide some examples of how Techcom Bank's clients have made a lasting impact through differentiated uh, wealth management practices like the ones you've mentioned? Uh, I'd love for you to highlight com a couple of examples there. Well, I, yeah, I think first of all, let, let's step back a little bit. Mm. Yes, entrepreneurs, w most of our clients are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. If you think about the affluent classes in uh, in Vietnam, many of them are affluent, not because they're salaried, but because mm -hmm. they've got businesses. Mm -hmm. Even salaried yeah, individuals these days have side businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously the internet is great for helping with that. Uh, so yeah, I'll, Potentially, you could say we're the wealth manager of choice for entrepreneurs. I mm. mean, I think we have 70, 80 percent of the affluent segment wow. in okay. uh, in Vietnam as our client base mm. or within our client base. Yep. We may have may have slightly more, yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, call it call it that. Um, and and as entrepreneurs, they're all generating. If you think about what they're doing through their businesses, they're creating employment. Uh, through employment, they're creating salaries and wages, which then get consumed back into the economy, which creates more demand, and through that demand creates new opportunities for new businesses and or job growth. Mm -hmm. It's a virtuous cycle of growth, which you see is why Vietnam, or one of the reasons why Vietnam has such, such a high GDP growth rate. Let's touch upon the values and principles that Techcom Bank applies in particular to the wealth management, but just in retail banking as a whole. 70 to 80% of entrepreneurs choose Techcom Bank if they're in a certain affluent class, as you mentioned. Why is that? What are the values that drive that adoption and business decision? Well, you customers? could go back uh, when we were the first to launch zero fees. Mm -hmm. uh, zero fees and 1% cash back on mm -hmm. a debit card. Back in those days, banks were you know, charging fees for mm -hmm. this and that. And Techcom mm -hmm. Bank, kind of said, you know, that's just not right. Okay. So let's eliminate those fees. Mm -hmm. That got us a lot of customers in. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we also were seeing that uh, you know, customers as wealth is growing, we've got mm -hmm. to find an outlet for that wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our real estate offerings uh, really became market leading. And, and I think as a result, we have have driven significant value for many of our customers through the opportunities to invest uh, right at the beginning into market-leading developments. Mm. You said earlier there's been some trouble with the real estate market. You know, mm. There's trouble everywhere with real estate market. It is not something that grows consistently yeah. over time. We all thought it did. You know, when I was growing up, everybody thought real estate prices was never dropped, and then suddenly in London they did drop, and it shocked everybody. The mm. US financial crisis, actually two of them have been related to property and, and property price value mm -hmm. uh, declines. And, and we've had a little bit of uncertainty here um, over the last few months in, yep. in Vietnam. But if you look beyond the short term, 
what you actually see is a population that has insufficient high quality housing. As Vietnam continues to grow, well, that will change. There has to continue to be development of better quality real estate for a growing population and a population mm -hmm. that has growing wealth. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're right to say real estate will continue in value. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is an asset class that we were very early to provide to our customers. And that also then generated uh, interest from more affluent. Well, Combine that yeah. with our fixed income capabilities mm -hmm. and then the service model that we've had. The introduction, for example, 10 years ago, the first bank to introduce priority banking. Um, it's uh, put it all together and what is it? It's, it's market leading offerings delivered in a way that is very seamless and intuitive and, and provides cost value to an individual consumer in a service model that they like. And ultimately with that, then drives rewards and recognition that resonate positively with our customers. Put it all together, that's been Techcom Bank secret. So it's not just access, but access to higher quality products and investment opportunities, which is my next question about building meaningful financial heritage. Uh, yes, you can buy any piece of land in an apartment, but if the build's not good, if the developer is, you know, didn't have their management uh, responsibilities in order, it could lead to a lot of customer disappointments. So let's talk about that access, but that access to higher quality products for financial sustainability. Could you touch on a couple of examples? And I, I asked that out of personal curiosity, but yeah. also for, I'm sure a lot of our, our viewers today are asking about the same kind of question. We're, we're actually pretty selective about the partners mm -hmm. that we decide to work with. Um, and so when we, when we choose partners, whether they're big or small, mm -hmm. we do a lot of due diligence around them. Okay. So when it comes in the real estate space, companies like Vin Homes, Masterize Homes have been key uh, um, partners for us, uh, and that's helped in the real estate space. Mm. We announced um, last year our partnership with Massa. Okay. And in that partnership in the WinLife ecosystem, we decided to embed ourselves because we felt Masan and Win, Win Commerce, etc., is okay. is a very strong FMCG mm -hmm. uh, partner with which we could create real value and synergies between Techcom Bank and and the uh, the Win stores. It's what three thousand five hundred odd across the country. Um, on the insurance side, uh, we've been very careful. We launched with Chubb recently because we felt not only do they have um, very strong general insurance products, but they also have some tremendous digital journeys that enable access to uh, very simple insurance products very easily for customers. Mm -hmm. um, but then others, you know, we first one of the first banks uh, here in Vietnam to sync up with, uh, with Apple Pay just recently right. launched. Yep. It's been hugely successful. Mm. Um, we, uh, we have a new partnership with Starbucks. So we choose partners very carefully based on not only the capabilities of the partner, but also on the needs of our clients. How do the partners partner? with tech company? Do they reach out to, to Darren on LinkedIn? Or? Some do, yeah. <laughs> some, some come. Um, some come to us, we go to others. Right. Uh, you know, it's nice that you know, Techcom Bank has a terrific um, brand right. uh, reputation here. Yeah. Um, actually, brand value is uh, what 1.4 billion, if I remember mm. correctly, and one of the top valued financial brands, brands in, 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 Vietnam. in Vietnam. I want to talk about the partnerships, because you mentioned a couple names, and I think they're all very well known. Uh, Starbucks, uh, that, that was unexpected, but I'm not surprised either. I think they're a great brand, and so is Tech Comp Bank. I'm amazed how many um, people like to upsize their coffee. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, they've done it. We actually have a podcast with the CEO of Starbucks Vietnam coming out very soon, so okay. stay tuned for Say that. Say you should have a coffee here. No, exactly. Maybe yeah. she'd... Maybe she can sponsor the show. Um, but I'd love to get your, your kind of perspective on what makes a good partner. Uh, I think you named a couple names, and not surprising. I think they all stand out in some way. But what, what are the values that drive a partnership in, in, in your mind and your, your team's mind? Actually, to be honest, I, I think that goes back to my eight years in, in Japan. Mm. Um, I, I had worked for a U.S. financial institution for, for many years, and, and the U.S. has a certain business dynamic. Mm. When you go to find a partner, you try to maximize the value you can get out of that partnership. Mm. Whereas in Japan, it's very different. Mm. It's about really making sure that there is not maximum value for you, but there's fair economics for both parties. Mm. Uh, and, and what I've seen over the years that when you work with partners and you work in a way that both partners, both par 
both sides in the partnership feel that they are getting fair economics uh, and uh, positive outcomes, that's the best partnership. Mm. If any any side in a partnership feels that they're being taken advantage of, mm. it never works. It yeah. always leads to failure. I agree with you. I, I have a model myself at Vietcetera where any sort of relationship, partner externally or internally with coworkers and all that it has to be a win-win if it's a win lose like too much like one benefits more than the other then of course it's not sustainable right and i think even on my side let's say uh, like let's say we have a partnership which not quite yet but we're on this podcast your side commercially whatever wins a lot but i don't or, or vice versa i might not even want to do it where yeah, I benefit a lot, but knowing that the other partner suffers, that's not really good. And, and you know, what do you do to address that, of course? Maybe not do the partnership yeah. in the first place, but, yeah. or second, you know, as soon as something like that happens, you have to correct it. And I think um, having those expectations together as partners is, is excellent. I think the brands can only do so much. I think that's 90% of the job, but that 10% of un, uh, understanding about outcomes as well is, is going to make that work. And, and great to hear that, um, you guys have thought about that and, and at least on the retail banking side have been very precise in those kind of partnerships. So awesome. Great to hear that, Darren. I would love to also talk about um, some practical advice and strategies. I think, um, you know, if you're a typical Vietnamese family here in Vietnam, buy land, that's the first thing you do or buy an apartment or get some gold or whatever it might be. Aside from those <laughs> advices and strategies, I'd love to hear from you. You've been 35 years in the business um, and, and more recently here, just a couple years in Vietnam, but bringing your, your experience over here, what are some tips you could share to our audience today in terms of wealth management and, and building that heritage that's built to last? I think it's a very young population. Mm. which is too long in cryptocurrency. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was reading somewhere it's like top five market in the world or something. It's yeah. a little bit too imbalanced, do you think? It's a that? little imbalanced. Okay. Uh, in the short term, mm. it, it, actually, it's a little speculative. Mm. Right? And if you've got a very high risk profile and you want to be speculative, that's fine. You can put a portion of your wealth to one side and say, hey, this is going to be my play money. Mm -hmm. And be prepared. You can get great returns, but mm. be prepared to also lose it, mm. potentially lose it all. Don't put, yeah, you've got your, your last, I don't know, 500 yep. million dong. Yep. Don't put that last 500 million dong uh -huh. into Bitcoin, right. thinking you're going to double it to a trillion and life is going to be good again. Mm. It, it might not. Uh, so, 250, yeah, <laughs> even though yeah, it's no. a little too much for you. Yeah. Anyways, not financial advice. I no think financial just some, advice. Yeah, just yeah, some, I'm not a CFA, uh, I'm not a licensed yeah, investment yeah. advisor, so take what I say with a pinch of salt. Yeah, yeah. However, think about, yeah, first of all, are you thinking long term? Or are you thinking short term? If, if it's short term, you can have a very different sort of attitude compared to yep. long term. Mm. If it's long term, you've got to be really careful. Don't time the market. Mm -hmm. Really don't time the market. Mm. And, and don't think, oh, this is going up. So many people see equities. Equity price is going up. Oh, I need to buy. And then equity price is going down. Oh, I need to sell. Well, actually, all you're doing is, is losing money. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to end up buying high and selling low, yeah, and, yeah. and that's exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. Right. So um, think about how much money do you want to put at risk? How much you put $100 in, are you prepared to lose zero? Are you prepared to lose $10, $20, $50? How much before you say, oh, actually, that, I don't want to do that? Mm -hmm. Right. Once you understand that, then you can start to think about how you build a more balanced portfolio mm -hmm. and how much is weighted into higher risk asset classes versus lower risk asset classes. Uh, think about what your financial needs are, um, not just your short-term spending needs, but what are the things coming up on the horizon? Are you mm -hmm. expecting to have a family? Are you expecting to have one or two children? Mm -hmm. uh, the cost of looking after those children is, is clearly going to have an impact on your financial capabilities, mm -hmm. and you need to plan for that. Right. If something was to happen, well, how do you ensure that the obligations uh, and the needs of your family can be taken care of in the event that you're not, not there or not able to work to take care of the family? You've got to put yep. all of this together mm -hmm. and then decide how much you put in land, right. which is, could be relatively illiquid right now. People mm -hmm. who invested in a lot of real estate last year, prices have come down in some of those developments. It's becoming a lot harder to sell than it traditionally used to be. So there's a little bit of a liquidity squeeze at this point. Bonds last year, second half of last year, there was some uh, dislocation of the bond market. So buyers 
were not plentiful. And as a result, people wanted to sell because they needed access to liquidity. They were finding the only way to sell is at a relatively large discount. It means they're taking a haircut and mm. they're taking a loss. Right. They could have still held to maturity. They would have continued to get their coupon, would have been fine. But if suddenly you need to sell because you need that liquidity, well, then you're subject to the vagaries of the market and where the market is. So, uh, so you've Darren, got to think of uh, all these things together. Yeah, I, uh, great practical tips and you know. So food I didn't. For I didn't give you a single equity. But name, not not I? financial advice yeah. exactly. Techcom um, makes doing really well there. Okay, very good. <laughs> I'll take a look. Um, I, I also kind of want to answer this question myself because it actually just uh, we got a lot of comments on this show and of various other shows. We have another one related to personal finance, and they're always asking for our guests like you to kind of talk about that or even me. And you know. For those of you listening, for myself at least, I, I recently adopted, no, I've, I've known it for a long time, but more serious about it, is how to live a rich life. But not rich in terms of, and wealth is kind of the same thing. It's not about how much money you have. That is, of course, important, but it's not about the number. It's about what kind of life you want to live and then building your financial planning around that. So for instance, when you mention, oh, buying land or buying this, yeah, for like me, I know what my answer is about it, and I'll, I won't share it today, but I'll share it for next time. And and as a result, I have made a conscious decision where I may not uh, or will save money for that. I'm not going to disclose on this show. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's a nice frame. I just wanted to share that because uh, you mentioned very similar tones. How do you see your life being? Is it what kind of wealth or uh, what kind of rich life you want to live and, and the build around that. So, Well, I, actually, we launched, uh, we launched here in Ho Chi Minh last mm -hmm. year, just a year ago, mm. uh, Inspire. Mm. Uh, and Inspire is, is uh, um, yeah, a whole tier. Brand, okay. We call them branded tiers. Inspire, Priority, and Private are branded tiers. Uh, Inspire there is, is for a generation generally aged in their mid-20s to, to late 30s. Uh, and it's about experiences, wanting to live their life on their terms. Mm. It doesn't mean to say that they don't still have some traditional Vietnamese values, family values and others, but they don't necessarily want to live their life in exactly the same way mm. as their parents did, sure. their grandparents or their great-grandparents. Uh, maybe you know, they've always wanted to play music. Mm -hmm. That means they don't necessarily want to work in agriculture. Uh, maybe they wanted to travel the world and they want to spend some time getting experiences outside of Vietnam. Maybe there's some other things that they would like to do. Yep. Inspire is about uh, enabling uh, our customers to personalize their financial experiences with us, but ultimately to enable them to pursue their own path. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Live Life Richly. Okay. And that's about that's good. enabling our clients to enjoy the richness of life, the very small moments that bring immense joy. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do with Inspire. And that is the inspiration for why not. Very good. Like, like having that Starbucks coffee every morning. I was not paid for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have two last questions for yeah. you, Darren. Um, the last, you kind of touched upon it, but I would love to see if you could share perhaps a, a precise example about some success stories of these tech conflict clients. Either it's the ones that have been with for 30 years or even more recently, the last two, as these new products have launched, for example. Have there been any highlights of outstanding results you've seen in terms of you know, wealth creation or repositioning of their uh, wealth management and thinking? Could you, could you highlight a couple yeah, of examples? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I don't think I can... Yeah, if it, if, name names. I can't <laughs> name names, no. <laughs> Confidentiality. Sure. Um, but, you know, if I think... As a good banker should. <laughs> as I think about how we're, uh, how we're focused on, on delivering for our clients, and I said we've got a lot of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. a lot of entrepreneurs running small businesses and so on, small yep. businesses growing into large businesses. Uh, and so if we think about how connected we are between our wholesale bank, our business banking teams, and our retail banking teams, we work very closely together to enable the success of, of all of our clients. And, and what we can see is very clearly over the 30 years, a significant number of our, bus of our individual clients starting up small businesses, growing those small businesses, ultimately some of those small businesses becoming very large businesses. Um, we've played a... Uh, we've played a big role in, in helping okay. that and creating a value chain for us and all of our clients. Mm. So, you know, I mentioned real estate. Not only do we enable people to buy real estate to live in, we enable customers to buy real estate to invest. 
Um, but that supports also some of our developer clients. As we have a great customer base, it helps them uh, move more, more real estate property. Mm. And it also enables them, as they issue bonds, for us to go back to more affluent clients and say, here, here's an investment asset that may suit your needs. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it's all interconnected, and mm. that creates value and success stories. Okay. Uh, an ecosystem. Quite a few. Not just retail banking, but a lot more. Thank you, Darren, for, for sharing your insights today. I have one last question for you. It's not about banking. It's actually yeah. about other stuff. So. On the show, we have experts of all kinds, for, from banking to real estate to airlines to media, whatever it might be. And the thing is, as a business leader, you'd like to know a little bit more outside of your industry to make yourself a little bit better at what you do or just out of personal interest. So for example, our last guest mentioned that they'd love to know more about sustainability, specifically about water. How does that, people read about the Mekong Delta and how there's less rain than normal, that kind of stuff. Um, and they just don't know about it out of personal curiosity. Anyways, we've had tons of different type of answers. So I think in your case, you know a lot about banking, but maybe there's something you don't know about that could make your job a lot better. So my question for you, Darren, is what kind of industry or topic would you like to know more about so we can invite guests from our network onto the show so you can learn something. You know, I, I've, I've been lucky. Um, I've, uh, I've managed very large uh, institutional businesses mm -hmm. over the years and, and as a result I've had, had access to some of the largest corporates and, and companies around the world. Mm. I've been very curious uh, and curiosity, all of us need to be curious. Mm -hmm. uh, if we really want to explore this world, we can't yep. have a closed mind. And I think, you know, depends on Whoever or whatever business that I've been working with, I've been really intrigued to, to learn much more about them. So yeah, right now we talk about sustainability as a, a, a fantastic uh, client of mine once was Indorama based out of, uh, out of Thailand and, okay. and into the plastics field. But the amount of work that they're doing in sustainability and in terms of being able to um, turn their businesses into one where waste, the waste products can be recycled, etc. It's incredible what they're doing. Bampu was another. Who think coal mining, right? But Bampu, green coal, and, and other things that they're doing in Indonesia uh, are, are really quite fascinating. When I was in Tokyo, we, we obviously used to have a lot of earthquakes, and I was there through the very significant earthquake mm -hmm. of March 11th, 2011. Uh, which tsunami, then led to believe, right? tsunami, yeah. Fukushima, right. uh, and the nuclear reactor meltdown. I became a real expert on uh, nuclear hazard. I became an expert on micro sieverts and, and how much radiation you could take, what things gave you radia radiation, mm. how to protect against radiation, etc. There's so many interesting things in this world. So mm. I think whatever you want to talk about, People will be interested as long as they're curious. Okay. Well, very good. If you have any expertise in one of the ones that you mentioned there from Darren, um, drop your comments in the, uh, in the comment section below. I'm sure our team would love to hear from you. Uh, Darren, it's been a pleasure to learn from you about, um, you know, starting with retail banking, but the whole ecosystem about wealth management and about the future of financial services in Vietnam. I'm sure Tech on Bank has a long way to go, but it's building those blocks already and, and it will grow as Vietnam grows. So thank you for those insights and um, let's see where Tech on Bank uh, takes us. So, thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Be uh, thank you everyone for tuning in for another episode of Vietnam Innovators. Uh, without you, week in and week out, the show will not be possible. So keep tuning in, subscribe, like, and comment, um, and we'd love to hear from our community. See you guys next time. Bye. Từ xa xưa, biểu tượng tứ quý đã bắt rễ vào nguồn cội văn hóa Việt, đại diện cho những giá trị được trọng vọng nhất. Trường tồn vững chãi như tù, cuộc cách kiêu hãnh như cúc, mạnh mẽ sinh sôi như trúc, cao sang phú quý như mai. Mang tinh thần của tứ quý, một dịch vụ ngân hàng đã ra đời để trân trọng những giá trị tạo nên các vĩ nhân. Techcombank Private, một gói giải pháp toàn diện trân quý những nhu cầu riêng biệt của quý khách. Liên kết các chuyên môn tài chính để khai mở những cơ hội đầu tư, không chỉ để sinh sôi tài sản, mà còn để những giá trị quý khách coi là quan trọng nhất được nảy lộc vượt nhiều thế hệ. Techcombank Private, giá trị sinh sôi, nảy lộc vượt thời. Hãy đón chờ!